Hey everybody, Dr. G here. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist and body language expert, and today we're going to be analyzing the behavior and body language of Maya Kowalski. Maya Kowalski and her family are currently suing Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital for over $200 million for a variety of reasons. Many of the claims center around her diagnosis and treatment of CRPS. What we're going to be talking about today is Maya Kowalski's testimony. We're going to be looking at her behavior and her body language. But before we get started, I wanted to remind you of a couple of things. One is this is not a psychological evaluation of any kind. I'm providing feedback and opinions based on publicly available information. On top of that, I do want to remind you to like and subscribe if you want to see more content just like this. All right, let's go. So one of the reasons I decided to do this is that after I watched her testimony, I thought about the fact that I have so many people say, would you just do a video on somebody showing honest body language or authentic body language because so many people that I cover are deceptive or show dishonest body language or show aggressive body language or whatever it is. So I thought today we were going to look at somebody who is demonstrating honest and authentic body language. Let's just jump right in. Um, do you remember the the why of going there that day, that um, morning? October 7th? The or, 7th. Okay. Yes. So I was in excruciating pain and this time my stomach was also like, it was awful. Um. All right. Now, this was a very authentic response. So I talk about we close our eyes when we talk about things that we don't like. So when she's talking about something being awful, her eyes close at the same time that she's saying it, her face, everything works in unison. And we oftentimes see when people are being deceptive, they struggle to keep all of those parts together. Let's watch that again. And this time my stomach was also like it was so this is somebody who's recalling something visceral. Awful. Um, I was complaining. My knees were up to my chest. I was crying. So my dad took me in. All right. So it was your father, not yes. your mother that took you in? And then the week prior, my dad also took me in. Mm -hmm. Tell me something. When you would go back to Johns Hopkins or in any of the doctors there, uh, were they immediately aware mm -hmm. of the history or did your dad or mom have to Explain it every time, your yeah, history. Speculation, your honor. <clears throat> Overall. Actually, yeah, my parents always had to re-explain my history of CRPS. From what you saw, was this frustrating for your family, to, your mom and dad, to have to explain the same thing every time you come in? Most definitely. All right. So, so right now she's answering things in clear and concise ways. There's nothing that a jury is going to be seeing in her that's going to make them feel like she's being deceptive. I talk about in another video problems that juries may have with certain behaviors. And so far, everything that Maya is saying, I think, is going to resonate with people as they watch it. Um, so you come in and your dad gives the, the summary of or describes your history. What do you recall after that? I remember just being in the ER, but I wasn't in the ER for too long. I remember I was transferred to the... So as you'll notice, I talk oftentimes about people licking their lips when they start feeling anxious. And as she's talking about the hospital, watch this right here. Summary of or describes your history. What do you recall after that? I remember just being in the ER, but I wasn't in the ER for too long. I remember I was transferred to the PICU. All right. And up to that point, while you were in the ER and up to the uh, uh, certain event, were, were you in, in pain? Were you calm? Were you active? What, were your, what was your outward manifest? I was actively in pain, yes. So you can see her blink rate is picking up. She's licking her lips. She is showing the signs of somebody who's feeling stress, who seems to be reacting to that just by talking about these experiences. Watch this part again. Active, what were your what was your outward manifest? I was actively in pain, yes. Right. Were you thrashing or acting out in any way at that point? At that point, no. So they took you up to the PICU and tell the jury what happened then. When I was transferred to the PICU, I remember my mom came in at some point. The nurses and doctors wanted to put a tube down my nose. And with CRPS, I mean, a blood pressure cuff, that hurts. So imagine, you know, like a tube being shoved down your nose. So as she's saying this, 
Watch her eyebrows right here. That hurts. So imagine, you know, like a tube being shoved down your nose. Now, she raises her eyebrows a little bit because that's the point when she wants to bring attention to her face. She wants you to hear this. And her eyebrows also show sadness. Thinking about the idea of going through that much pain genuinely makes her sad. So we're seeing somebody who is authentically and genuinely reacting to fear about pain that she might experience. So this seems very legitimate and very real to me. Listen to your stomach. And obviously that would have caused so much pain. And I knew. My- Once again. There's those eyes closing. Watch, watch her say this again. Obviously, I, that would have caused so much pain. And I knew. My- that type of emphasis, the eyes closing, all of it in, working together in concert. This is someone who I genuinely believe is thinking about how it, painful it would be to go through these, these things. Because one of the things I talk about in a lot of videos is performance. Because we can identify when people are performing. People definitely know how to play up things, how to exaggerate behaviors, or try to at least. Oftentimes, it's pretty easy to spot. There's nothing I'm seeing right now that feels performative in the way that Maya is describing all of this. My body. I knew I was not going to be able to tolerate that. Um, that is the only time. And then watch her head, head shake right here. Now, I talk oftentimes when we're feeling something, head nods and head shakes. When it's natural, it happens while we're talking about it. When it's unnatural, we oftentimes do it afterward because we think, okay, I need people to know I'm not okay with this. Watch this right here. Body, I knew I was not going to be able to tolerate that. Right. I was not going to be able to tolerate that. That is very much an authentic response in what she believed. Um, that is the only time I asked for sedation. I didn't just randomly yell out, I need sedation, like depicted in the medical records. I only asked for sedation when they wanted to do that procedure. So this is something that probably frustrates her. Watch, see her eyebrows right here? Listen to what she's saying. Just randomly yell out, I need sedation. Like She seems to be very authentically responding with some frustration and anger that someone may have claimed that she was asking for things that she didn't need. Like, depicted in the medical records i only asked for sedation when they wanted to do that procedure and then were you given sedation before they tried to put this tube down your nose i was not um and my mom was actually in the room and she listened to the doctors and didn't demand for sedation instead about like i would say two or three people held me down and tried to get the tube down my nose That is when I was screaming, crying, and thrashing around. I did not curse at any of the staff. That is a lie. Um, So you hear the intensity in her voice. As she's recalling this, this is not someone who's putting on a performance. It's not someone who's making claims of things that they're not actually feeling. The emotion seems very real. Her voice sounds pressured. She appears to be anxious and slightly irritated by these claims that have been made. So what we're hearing is a very natural and authentic emotional reaction to memories that she is experiencing as she's talking about this. That is when I was screaming, crying and thrashing around. I did not curse at any of the staff. That is a lie. So when she said, I did not curse at any of the staff, she raised her eyebrows. She really wants people to hear that. That's important for her to clarify because she's saying that those claims have been made and that's absolutely not true. And the fact that she wants you to look at her while she's saying that really does emphasize that she wants people to see this. This is a moment that she's not trying to be deceptive. This really is something authentic for her. Well, it was norm. It was just like the upper body portion because they were trying to get the tube in my nose. So they were holding on my shoulders and just like my. All right. Now you see how much she's moving her hands right now. This is so visceral for her. She's actually reliving a little bit, trying to guide people, showing them exactly what happened. We do oftentimes see this as a sign of honesty. doesn't mean that every time somebody talks with their hands they're being honest. But when people are recalling things and they can't help but put their hands in certain places and it seems natural, we oftentimes take that as something that they feel very strongly about. Later I found out it was Sally Smith. Did anyone from the hospital differentiate Sally Smith from any of the other doctors that you were seeing that day? Absolutely not. Did Dr. Smith uh, explain her role in any way? Never. And did she question your dad? And I don't know about you, but did she question you or your dad about symptoms and history? She actually believing your honor. Overall. No, I do not recall that. So if we're to think about the psychology of a jury watching this, she is answering questions very, very directly. There's nothing that she's showing that suggests that anything that she is saying is deceptive. 
Now, does that mean that she remembers things correctly? Not necessarily. People can remember things wrong. But the way that she is replying to these, this is exactly how she remembers it. I don't think that she's saying a single thing that she does not believe. And did you subsequently find out who that was? Later, I found out it was Sally Smith. Did anyone from the hospital differentiate Sally Smith from any of the other doctors that you were seeing that day? Absolutely not. So I talk about this a little bit in another video, but I think it's important that I talk about this again here. Basically, one of the things that's extremely important for psychologists, and I know that Dr. Smith is not a psychologist, she's an MD, which is different. However, as a psychologist, we have to provide what's called informed consent. Someone has to be able to consent to some kind of treatment or assessment that we are providing, even if it's mandated, even if they are required by a court or whatever to take this assessment or be evaluated, we have to tell them exactly what's going on. We are not allowed to deceive. Uh, the last time I saw my mom, my dad wasn't there. Um, I was laying in the bed. This is while you're in your room. Did you get Still in the PICU. Still in the PICU? Still in the PICU, yes. So this is pretty close to when you checked in? Or yes, got it yes. I, was, I know I was still in the PICU. Um, my mom was, like, picking up her work bag and just, like, little things she had brought to the hospital and... She said, I love you and I'll see you tomorrow. And I never saw her again. Need some water? Yeah. Um, I noticed you're wearing a necklace. Why don't you explain that? Yeah, so... Um so December 10th was my birthday. I turned 11, and I was unfortunately still in the hospital at the time. And the hospital has this program where they collect funds um, for children who are still in the hospital on their birthday. I was given $20 to spend. And um, I remember the social worker came in, and she asked me what I'd like to buy. I bought a Nerf gun for my brother. I bought my mom a necklace, and then I bought my dad his favorite bag of mints because I didn't have a lot of money left over. But then my Aunt Wendy bought him this little glass Christmas tree, and we just said it was for me. So I haven't been providing for the past minute or so much feedback about the body language because I think anybody can see this is a very real reaction. For those of us that watch a lot of true crime, for those of us that are involved in or watch a lot of trials, we see and hear a lot of tragedy. But there's something so unspeakably painful about hearing Maya talk about not knowing that that was going to be the last time she saw her mother and the circumstances around this. It, it, to think about the impact, the psychology of a jury hearing this, I don't see how they're not going to find this exceedingly compelling because it is hard not to feel moved and distraught by watching Maya talk about these things. Um. But I bought my mom this very specific necklace that says I love you to the moon and back. It's just like she always said that to me. Um, and then I found out later that she wore it every single day. And when she was found in the garage, she was still wearing it. And I have it on my neck right now. Have some water. Sorry. Get through it. So part of the reason I'm showing this is not to make everybody deal with the excruciating pain of hearing Maya talk about this unspeakable tragedy. But one thing I want you to focus on also is that the attorney is saying, here, have some water. He is actually trying to get her to stop crying so that she can provide testimony. There is nothing about this that is a performance. And part of the reason I point that out is I assume most people don't see it that way, but you never know because I get all sorts of feedback and comments on videos and people never – there's never a shortage of people surprising me about what they think and feel about these things. And I want to be very, very clear. There's nothing inauthentic about anything that we are seeing regarding Maya so far. Nothing. Can we publish uh, 27, excuse me, 2571 We're going to switch for a second there, Maya, and uh, ask you about uh, obvious symptoms at the time and just so you understand, 
giving somebody a tissue, giving them a water bottle, that actually does help people stop crying. That's one of the reasons in therapy we're oftentimes trained to don't hand somebody a tissue if they start crying because that's signaling them, hey, would you stop doing that? So therapists still do that sometimes. But generally speaking, that's it is an effective way for people to rein in these kinds of emotions. And it's working for Maya right now, as tragic as everything she's talking about is. I mean, I stay there over 90 days, but I had way more than three rooms. And these rooms had surveillance cameras. And when I was placed in, in those rooms with the surveillance cameras, I was told that to not worry about them, they don't work. So now, if we could, there has been uh, allegations here that you were uh, outside your room 95% of the time. Can you tell the jury whether that's true? That's not true at all. Most of the time I was in my room. There were times where I went to PT, which I was outside my room, and there was a few occasions where I went to the rec room. So you hear the way she's responding to this, and I hate to point this out because maybe it seems so obvious. They're asking her questions, and she is refuting things that have been claimed directly. She's saying, no, that's not true, and here are details. Contrast that with some of the other testimonies provided, and it sounds very very different. So one of the things that is powerful for a jury is when somebody is asked a question, they answer it or they say yes or they say no, that they are direct about exactly what happened and how they feel about it. And that is exactly what Maya is doing, which is going to play very, very powerfully to a jury. Um, but for, I would say the majority of my time, I was kept in my room. And was there, did the rooms have the kids that were there, their names on the door or next to the door? So at one point, I started to get wheeled out into the hallways and whatnot. Um, and that's when I was going to PT or the rec room. Uh -huh. And I noticed something really weird was that all the other rooms on the floor, they had name tags. It would say the patient's name. and. So l look at this expression right here. Uh -huh. And I noticed something really weird. So that is something that genuinely concerned, confused, makes her angry. Oftentimes when we think about things we've been through, we start reacting to it as though we're there. So as she's talking about this, as she's thinking about this, this is a very real reaction you're seeing her have, talking about her name not being on the door. Weird was that all the other rooms on the floor, they had name tags. It would say the patient's name and just the last initial. Whereas with mine, I just had a sheet of paper in there with color-coded stickers. I asked the nurses what the color corresponded to and what that meant and why I didn't have a name, and they would not tell me. I asked multiple nurses, and all of them said, I can't tell you. So this goes back to that idea of informed consent. Because she was a minor, that does complicate what she is and isn't going to give information on when she asks, So, but a parent always should. So once again, when people ask me about something, when it's related to psychology or when it's related to an evaluation, if it's something that I can't tell them, I'll give them a very specific reason why and say, you'll be able to read about this in the report, but I can't tell you about that right now. And I'll, ex I would explain it if there was some legitimate reason for that. So her reaction to this is understandable. It probably felt very dehumanizing to not be allowed a name like everybody else. And then to not get an explanation for why she wasn't provided a name. Let's play uh, B, 2608B. Um, how, how about, how are you doing? How is PT and OT going for you? Uh, not good. Why um, is okay, Fiona, we can't discuss any of those type of matters, okay? Okay. It's so confusing to me why they wouldn't allow them to discuss these kinds of things because I've been involved in lots of parental fitness evaluations. I've been involved in lots of cases related to children that are separated from their families. So this is all very familiar to me. And the rules that they set up around this, the guidelines where they wouldn't allow them to talk about certain things, is very peculiar to me. I really have a hard time understanding the logic there. There's so much more we could go over with Maya's testimony, but that would also make for a very, very long video. Hopefully this is giving you some understanding of why I believe that everything that Maya is saying is authentic to how she recalls it and how she experienced it. If there's other parts of the testimony you want me to analyze, if there's other people you want me to analyze, please let me know. There's so much involved in this trial. But hopefully this helps you better understand some of her behavior and her body language, and hopefully it helps you better understand what honest body language appears like, what authentic body language appears like, because so often I'm talking about deceptive body language. So 
If there's other people you want me to analyze, please let me know. And the last thing before we get finished up is I do want to remind you to like and subscribe if you want to see more content just like this. All right. Thanks for watching.